This week on Kentucky Afield. There you go, pretty fish. We're enjoying one of the state's premier fishing locations, Dale Hollow Lake. And we're doing it by catching trophy smallmouth bass. Oh, come on in there. There we go. Next, we'll take to the hills in search of a bear den. Then, we're looking ahead to spring turkey season. Yes, I've burned about 120 yards out right now. It's all next on Kentucky Afield. Kentucky Afield. Every week, Kentucky Afield brings you features on hunting and fishing across the state. What a nice fish. It's an opportunity to hopefully get that bird in the lake. Hey, we got another one over here. There he is. Ooh, a nice one, too. Boy, he's healthy. What do we got? <laughs> Awesome. Got the first oh. Barely made it out in the field. Got one. Big small mouth. Very nice. Double point. They're in there. There they go. <laughs> Look at that joker. Woo. <laughs> that's a good one there. Look at that. Oh. Whoa, this is a good one. That's better than good, Chad. Hello, and welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. If you talk to any angler, you've probably heard the term big bait equals big fish. But in the winter months when smallmouth fishing, the float and fly method changes the rules. Well, today we're out right here at beautiful Dale Hall Lake and I'm with Greg Brizendine of Dust Dell and Guide Service. Hey, we got a little bit of rain we're gonna to battle today, but you know what? I'm super excited to watch you and participate in the float and fly method. I know you have perfected it, and it's a great technique for catching large suspended smallmouth bass, isn't it? That's correct, and we should have some luck today, hopefully. You know, it's late winter. This is the time of year that you like to use this technique. I know you're doing some things a little different now. You've gone away from some of the hair juice. Yes, I have. I've caught three fish over six pounds in my lifetime, two of them have been on the bait we're gonna be using today, which is a two and a half inch piece of plastic. Float and fly is a technique that's really good in the winter time, but it's also really effective when it's hard to catch them other ways, like suspending fish, right? And that's what we're targeting, is suspended fish. And yes. a lot of people struggle catching suspended fish because it's really hard to hold your bait in that strike zone. But when you got a bobber on the top and a leader, you can kind of go, okay, the fish look like they're in 12 feet of water. We just want to be 12 or shallower, right? Correct. Above you always want to be above the fish, yes. Because if you've ever looked at a fish very much, 90% of them, their eyes are towards the top of their head. So yeah. it's designed for them to be looking up. If you're a bass fisherman and you go, yeah, maybe this is not the way I want to fish every day. If you are fishing for suspended fish and you're struggling catching fish, this is a technique you need to give a try. Yes, most definitely. It's been a proven technique for years now. Floating fun. I was told that it was developed over in East Tennessee by crappie fishermen, mm -hmm. and they ended up catching smallmouth bass more than the crappie, and they spread it all over Eastern Kentucky and then into Central, and it's been around for a long time, and it's the deadliest method that I know how to use to catch large fish. There you go. Pretty fish. Right where he's supposed to be. Well, that was the first bobber that went straight down. I had one earlier, but I missed a fish. Right. This is the kind of fish we were talking earlier that would be a, a hard fish to locate and fish unless you were using some type of bait that you could sink down and count it down. Right. But then it's hard to fish it this slow. Exactly. And you can fish it really slow at a certain depth, and that's what it took. I don't know if any other method you could fish it any slower. Well, that's a good fish, a beautiful fish. Typical Del Hollow fish, they got a lot of black in yes. them. Well, nice job. Swimming right to us. Oh, he's going to show us. Yeah. About the same about fish. About another twin, I believe. There you go. I believe yours a little heavier. See what we got here. 
Hey, he's he got even a... come up and jumped a little for Yeah, us. he did. Yeah. There you go. About the same fish that you caught, I believe. This fish, as you can see, the vertical bars on him are really pronounced. Or the fish I just caught, they were more blended in. That has a lot to do with how much oxygen that they use out of their bodies while they're fighting, because I don't think they breathe well while they're fighting. It's not real thick in this area, but, but look at that belly. It's very possibly it could be a female. I enjoy catching fish like this yes. because when you have a nine or 10 foot rod doubled over with eight pound test on it, you're trying to get a fish that wants to jump and run under the boat. Right. <laughs> you got your hands full, don't you? It's a tussle. And you, and you can feel every movement that fish oh, makes yeah. with that pole. I yeah. mean, you don't miss nothing. I mean, yeah. that's the ultimate fight that there is. Let's get it back in. The old floating fly coming alive for yes. us. Check out that eagle right there on that rock. There's something down there. He's he asked. just grabbed something. He grabbed something. He sure did. Grabbed him a fish. A manna or something, didn't he? You got that eagle named? No, but I should. I mean, I see them all the time. <laughs> There's a pair of them down here on this end of the lake. I've seen them a lot in the last few weeks together. I've got photos of them sitting in the trees together. Usually if they got eggs, one of them will stay there yeah. to keep the eggs warm. They don't usually leave. Those eagles, they usually follow you around because they know that you know where the fish are at. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, look at there, those green fish like that, uh, uh, that little it. plastic jig too. <laughs> they do. This is a good size, healthy largemouth, but I have seen people catch four and five pounders. I'm sure you've seen it a lot. Oh yeah. Pretty for a large mouth here. Nice job. So Greg, if someone wanted to come out and try this technique out, what's some tips that you'd give them as far as, uh, obviously you need a long rod, but give me some other Correct. things that you'd, uh, you'd consider before coming out and trying this. Well, one of the main things I would consider is this gentleman right here. This is a center weighted bobber. You can do this without it. It's just an aid in detecting strikes. If it doesn't have weight pulling it down, it won't stay upright. It will lay over on its side, mm. that being center weighted. So this center weighted bobber, the way it sets up there, if a fish comes up and takes it from the bottom, you're saying it will it, roll over like this and will, you know. If you ever see both colors, that floats telling you that you're either on the bottom or something is pushing up on that bait, which is a strike indicator is what it is. A lot of times they'll come up and just take the weight of the jig off, which is very light. We're fishing with a 16th ounce lead head. So yes, <laughs> it is light. I mean, they're little. You don't need a lot to suspend that bait. You just need something that will keep the plastic from floating. So as far as how long the leader is, that's different every day, I guess. Well, but I want to be above them. If the fish are suspended up real close to the bank, I may not throw but up like an eight foot leader. But when they're off the bank a little bit, anywhere from 10 to 12. Oh, here we go, fish on. Here he comes. Uh oh. Come on in there. There we go. There you go. That's about exactly like the other one. It's a solid three pound fish, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. Look how little that mouth is on that. That's pure smallmouth right there. That is. It's such a cool fish. I love that color. Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, they're in really good shape. Yeah. So Greg, you and I fished several times before, and I know you obviously love to float and fly. We talked about throwing those hair jigs at night, which is your favorite thing to do. Right. We've showcased both of them. There you go, bite. I hate that you got interrupted. Oh, this interrupt me anytime you want when that bobber disappears. <laughs> I, did, I told you that time. <laughs> I was looking at you. I know. <laughs> I was watching your float. <laughs> I love it. Oh, it's a little nicer fish, too. Yeah. There we go. Got it? It's good. There, there we you go. go. Right there in the <laughs> right there in the top of the lip. It's perfect. That's how you set. want it, isn't it? Exactly. This style of fishing right here, watching this float go under, then fighting the fish with this long, wimpy rod, these things are addictive. Black bear populations here in Kentucky has been increasing the last several years, and biologists are collecting data on those bear cubs as soon as they leave the den.
We're here today in Wayne County with Dr. John Hass. So we're here today to learn a little bit about bears. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, we're gonna actually go and check out a potential mother bear that yep. may have some cubs, right? Mm -hmm. So how long have you been doing this project? How many bears have you got to sample? And what are you, what are you finding out? Yeah, so over the years, I mean, going back to when uh, I was at the University of Kentucky and the people before me there, we've been doing bear dance since about 2002, 2003. So we've got a huge, long 20 plus year data set. As bears have increased their population here in Kentucky and we've moved into a hunting season, this has been something we've been doing really since there were bears in Kentucky. A long piece of ribbon. We'll go in on that side and then climb up on top of that log and drop off. Was the easiest what we got today, litter size, and then what is the sex ratio of that litter. Uh, this particular bear, this is the second time we've dinned her. She's been wearing a collar for about four and a half years. And that's the other thing we do. This is a good, easy opportunity to update her collar. So two years from now, we'll probably come back and, and check her out again. Some bears in Kentucky don't do true hibernation. A lot of times they're just very lethargic and they'll come out of their dens at times. And that's what we're looking at right now. She is awake in the sense that she is cognizant of what's going on around her. It's something that's very typical that we deal with when we do the dens. So ideally what we want to do is get the dart to the shoulder, the muscle grip there, and the fat the content is not as thick in the shoulder. It's safe for the animal. So it takes about, on average, 10 or 12 minutes for the drug to start working, depending on the shot placement. So about 12 minutes, we should see that induction start to happen. That's all it sees, too. Got their eyes opening, about a month old. It's a male female. That's a male. Any other information in the 20 plus years you guys have been doing bear study that you just find very interesting? Yeah, the biggest thing that I think, and it's a, it's a wonder of the bear world, is they will reproductively compensate based on like their density. If they're in a place with a high density, they're gonna produce more male offspring that then disperse out. So they're leaving that area. So somehow they can tell physiologically that the place has got a lot of bears, they have more males, those males leave. So they're almost controlling the population a little bit on their own All biologically. Right. Yeah. yeah, and so down here, this is a little bit younger population. We're not as high of a density. We are seeing more females. So when you look at our sex ratio between say Wayne and McCreary County to Harlan, Letcher, Pike, places we've had bears for a long time now, it is more skewed to females down here. And it tells us a little bit about how our populations are growing. The rate of these cubs that are making it to adulthood is pretty high in Kentucky, isn't it? It is. We don't have a lot of really good information on that true cub survival, but around the area, including what the numbers we've got, about 80 to 90 percent. Wow, that's spectacular. So, yeah, it shows how quickly our, our population's grown. So what we do with all our cubs is we put a pit tag in them, which is a passive integrated transponder. They'll have a unique barcode to each individual and this will stay with them for the entirety of their life or we can take a scanner and be able to find those later on if this bear comes up if we catch it again or if it shows up in harvest we'll be able to identify that bear and when we caught it so between the sex and the number that's in the litter that provides us with good data for our population estimation so these just go under the skin And that's it. What we did today is a big component of, of understanding how many new bears we're recruiting into the population annually. And you guys have got a lot of metrics set into your bear season, if you're not a bear hunter, to know that you're trying not to take females and you're trying not to take younger bears. Yeah, exactly. This is a, a great thing to point out. So with our den work, we know that our females that are expecting cubs go in the den mid-December. So I always get a lot of questions about why is our late rifle season in December so late. Part of it is be conservative or protecting some of these bears that we know are having 
cubs that year. It can make hunting a little bit tougher, but at the same time, it's an opportunity to get out that's gonna take more of those younger males. It's a conservative way to protect the resource and provide opportunity, and that's really what the Department of Fish and Wildlife tries to do. Exactly. Provide opportunity, protect the resource. Mm -hmm. Are you ready for the 2024 spring turkey season? Well, it'll be here before you know it. Right now. 
sees this hen goes in the woods, we're going to only have a 50 50 chance. exciting turkey hunt. I've never been lucky enough to use a hen. I'd like to go over there and shake her hand. She, that hen, I called the hen in and then she called this gobbler in. All I did was give him enough excitement to keep him out in the field where I had a chance and not up in the woods where that hen is. That was, I tell you what, quite often when you try to compete against a real hen, you don't win. And I didn't I didn't outcall that hen. What happened is I just made myself easier. I was in between the hen and the bird. And when he saw the decoys, he decided he had to go check them out. Wow, that was awesome. Let's go check this bird out. Look at her right there. This hen right there. <laughs> she sat right behind me for an hour. And I'd call and she'd call. And it was a battle of bringing that turkey in. This thing was so far away that the first two or three times that we thought we may have heard a gobble, wasn't sure it was a gobble, it was that far away. We're talking 400 yards. And I knew that if I could get that bird into this field and keep it in this field, it would make its way to my decoys. And sure enough, I think if I'd let it go another eight, 10 feet, I believe it was gonna beat the fire out of my uh, Jake decoy. But I, in these blinds, you got certain windows where you can shoot, and it was getting right to the edge of my, my window, so I had to pull the trigger. Let's go check it out. Man, opening morning, slow as it could be for me. Did see those hens, but then was able to start working this bird with the help of a live hen about 40, 50 yards behind me. What a beautiful bird. Look how sharp these hooks are on that bird. Man, look at all the color. It's a no surprise that Ben Franklin wanted this to be the American bird. I mean, it's blue, red, and white all over the head. Today, this is one of my favorite styles of hunting. Even though we had to wait them out and it wasn't running gun, getting a bird strutting and gobbling all the way, that is about as exciting as it gets. I am super excited to have this bird. Now let's check in and see who else has been out having fun in this week's Ones That Didn't Get Away. Check out this giant three pound crappie that was caught by Kenny Ray at Taylorsville Lake. What a fish. Phil High School said he's having his best spring bite on Green River Lake ever in his 60 years. No bananas on this fishing boat. Nice job. Check out this nice flathead catfish that was caught by Cody Angel at Giss Creek Lake. Nice job. Here we have 10-year-old Jarrett Bowen with his first duck ever that he took in Breckenridge County. Nice job. Here we have a nice hybrid bass that was taken from Giss Creek Lake by Hannah Wall. Nice job. Here we have Marvin Medford with a nice four pound Lake Barkley smallmouth. Nice job. Here we have Gage Hales with two nice white crappie. These fish were caught at Kentucky Lake. He said the crappie fishing is getting good. Here we have Jeff Bonham with a nice five pound largemouth that he caught while fishing at Cedar Creek. Here we have Allison Finley with a nice channel catfish that she caught while fishing at her farm pond in Campbell County. Nice job. Do you know a youth that's interested in youth turkey season? Well, this upcoming weekend, April 6th and 7th is your chance. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water. 
Nothing sends shivers down your spine like the sound of a gobbling tom echoing through the woods. It's time to apply the face paint and pattern your shotgun because Kentucky's spring turkey season is coming up soon. Be sure you have your hunting license and permits and are up to speed on the rules and regulations. For more information, visit fw.ky.gov or call 1-800-858-1549.